So Angelo, where shall we start? Um, tell us a bit about where you are, what sort of wines you make there. Um, I presume lots of us will already know the Valpolicella. Has anybody ever been to the Valpolicella or to Nicole's winery in particular? Um, if you have, put your hand up or give us a shout or put in the chat or something. Um, but Valpolicella, the area where we make four different wines from the same grapes, uh, which yes. is really quite unusual. Um, so that's sort of going to be the, uh, the theme of the evening, is we're going to talk about that and then we might also talk a bit about what it's like to work in a uh, family winery because in fact Angelo is, uh, is new in the winery, uh, just a couple of years you've been working there now, isn't it? So I think that's also going to be quite intriguing. So, Angelo, start telling us something about the Valpo, please. Okay. Yes, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, and uh, enjoy your meal first. And, uh, but first, I want to say thank you to Fire to organize this uh, special event about the Valpolicella wines, that uh, is very important and uh, is uh, all what we, we can do now in this this unlikely period, but uh, it is very, very interesting, uh, new, but uh, I think it's a really, really nice idea. So thank you again. So I'm uh, Angelo Nicolis. I'm uh, the third generation of uh, Nicolis winery. So the first generation was my grandfather and uh, the second, uh, my father, that is still working at the winery as the head winemaker and uh, with my grandfather, that is the, the viticulturist, so he's working in the vineyards. And me, I'm a winemaker too, so the third generation, just graduating in winemaking in 2018. I had uh, two harvests outside of Italy, just to escape uh, for in, at the, from the family business a bit. <laughs> and uh, so I worked in, uh, in California and uh, in Australia. And after I came back last year uh, in, uh, in April and I started to work at the winery 100% like uh, assistant winemaker. And also I travel uh, when we need to travel to promote the wine uh, in the world. So tonight uh, I prepared for you a short uh, PowerPoint about uh, the Valpolicella and our winery. So I will share it on the screen. Can you see it? Yes. So, so we are, um, I don't know if you ever been in Valpolicella, but I think most of you probably yes. So we are uh, in the Northeast of Italy. So close to the city of uh, Verona. So a very historical uh, Roman city and uh, Valpolicella it's uh, between Verona and uh, Lake Garda. And uh, if, you, if we speak about the uh, biggest uh, town, biggest city of Italy, Verona is in the middle between Venice and uh, Milan. Uh, Valpolicella uh, is an historical area where uh, the wine has been an actor for a long, a long time because uh, papers, historical paper talking about Valpolicella since uh, the Roman Empire. So because we had this uh, fiume called uh, Adige, where they brought the, the wine outside of Valpolicella, so around the Roman Empire. Valpolicella is uh, in total, uh, to, we are talking about uh, 8,000 hectares, uh, because it's moving, 8,000 hectares. So it's a, we can consider Valpolicella as a medium size. And uh, Valpolicella is divided in two different zones. So we have uh, Valpolicella Classica, so the most historical, and uh, is the, um, the west side of Valpolicella. And uh, the east side of Valpolicella is considered Valpolicella Allargata, so the new Valpolicella. Also, the wines are little, in the philosophy, it's a little bit different, but uh, we have just one parliament that decided for the rules. So we have exactly the same rules, uh, but uh, different uh, philosophy and different concept uh, of the wine. 
Also, if you can, you can imagine that uh, we are in Valpolicella Classica, so we are uh, closer to the Lake Garda, and Lake Garda has uh, an influence to the, to the landscape, uh, to the climate. Uh, so, of course, uh, the wines product in Valpolicella Classica are, uh, of course, a bit different between uh, the Valpolicella Allargata. Um, so, we are in, in a town called San Pietro in Cariano, so we are in the heart of uh, Valpolicella Classica. The picture that you can see now, it's our uh, tasting room and uh, it's our icon because uh, this is a really historical building where my grandfather, we used to have uh, also not just wine and vineyards, uh, but also uh, cow and a lot of animals. And this building was used at the beginning for the cows, for the, the cow, for the, the chicken, for example, for the animals. And after became our main tasting room to the first floor. And the second floor is the, the one of the three drying room that we have where we dry the grapes to make the, the Amarone, so the main uh, uh, wine of Valpolicella. Um, our winery has been founded, uh, as I said before, from my grandfather in 1851. And uh, my grandfather had uh, eight sons, so four brothers and four sisters. Just uh, this is all the brothers and sisters. And uh, at that time, at the beginning, you know, the wine they produce wine you know for friends uh, so big glass bottles so we're not a real business as we consider the wine business today and um, so my father at the time was working uh, in another winery to make experience after the school after the, the university at the at that time and after uh, unluckily in 1991 my grandfather died, so my father decided to go back to the, to the winery and start to produce wine uh, at home. So, as I said, uh, my father on the right is uh, the winemaker, and he follow all the <clears throat> all the passages in in the cellar, and he follow also the the promotion of the wine in uh, around the world. Of course, now uh, me and mostly going around to promote the wine and he stay more in the cellar, but uh, he is, of, of course, the, the head, the main winemaker of the cellar. My uncle is uh, the agronomist, so follow the, the, the passages uh, in, the, in the vineyards. Of course, they are uh, all the time in contact because, uh, you know, the good wine comes from good grapes, so every, everything could be matching at, per, at the perfection together to arrive uh, at a goal, uh, so to have a really a good and authentic wine uh, in the bottle. In uh, Valpolicella, uh, we have uh, this particular kind of growing systems because uh, uh, the, the most uh, famous, the most recognized uh, growing system in the world is the Guyot, so the, the picture below. In Valpolicella, we have this different system called pergola, where, uh, as you can see, the vineyards build this, uh, this roof where the, the clusters are below this roof and they are really, really covered from the sun. And that's very important because uh, they, cannot, uh, they cannot burn and uh, they are very healthy in, in the shadow. Um, we have uh, uh, 42 can hectares. Can I just say? Um, can you tell us, some, I know we're not really, I, I know some people are more interested than, than others, but about the, the, pergola, the pergola was the traditional way of, of uh, growing in the Valpolicella for, for decades and then there was a big move towards Guyot and then recently things have been going back to pergola. Where do you sit on that? Do you have most of your vineyards that are pergola or Guyot and of the new ones are you planting them in pergola or in Guyot? Yeah, so uh, Pergola was uh, always the, so the, the, the historical, the, we hadn't uh, um, Guyot in the Valpolicella, but our system from the beginning was the Pergola. But there is a reason, because at the beginning with Pergola you can have more quantity, 
compare with the Guio. So at the beginning, so with the Venetian Republic, so historically, uh, the wine from Verona was not really, yeah, was uh, considered a quality wine, but they were used to produce uh, more more quantity compared with, for example, France or something other place that with the yeah, Guyot from the beginning. After, uh, with the, the, the growing of the business, uh, a lot of producers also try to use uh, Guyot. We have some Guyot too, but mostly you can find Pergola in Valpolicella. Guyot, uh, you have less quantity, but uh, we, the laboratory, the one uh, lab that we have here in Valpolicella, try to do a comparing between the same, the same plot of vineyard, the same plot of the vine with pergola and the same plot of uh, the vine with Guyot. And uh, they say, they, they saw that with pergola, Corvina grape, so the main grape of Valpolicella, is uh, growing better and also the maturation is better. And uh, so pergola is the main, uh, the main one for the grapes that we have here, also for uh, the climate, uh, because uh, with this roof, there is a lot of wind that is going across, uh, across the pergola. And there is a, a good, very, very good ventilation for the cluster like this uh, compared with the Guyot that they are really in the, in the leaves. Uh, so it's, uh, it probably wasn't. It probably wasn't by chance. In fact, that the pergola was the became the traditional way of growing grapes. Um, there was a good reason, and that that reason carried on for years and years. And then somebody had this bright idea of you know taking travel. You know, somebody probs traveled more and saw something. I thought, hey, you know that works in France. Let's let's do it. You know, they seem to be doing really well. Let's bring it and do it. And then you you find out that actually it doesn't really suit your terroir. It's all about with getting back to this thing of, of terroir and what really uh, works with the grapes in the region. And, and then you find out that perhaps, you know, tradition, there's a reason yeah, uh, like that. Exactly what happened because, you know, France, uh, if we can consider France uh, has been uh, always the, at the first, at the top, you know, maybe Italy at the second, sometimes uh, Italy at the first, uh, France but was, has been always France and Italy, but uh, a lot of uh, Italian winemaker, a very famous winemaker for famous winery in Italy. They studied a lot the, the French uh, method. They studied a lot with the, in the French university, and uh, maybe of course they they brought the, some French method. So Cuyo, for example, for the viticulture in Italy, and uh, that's the, that's also, for example, if you think about. Uh, Super Tuscan, so Tignanello, Sassicaia are the biggest wine of Italy, so the most famous wine of Italy and of the top 10 in the world. And uh, the, the winemaker uh, studied uh, in France, uh, the system of growing is Guyot. So yes, but in this case for Corvina, uh, they weren't so lucky because we decided to keep the pergola and to be proud of uh, <laughs> our pergola. But uh, yeah. We have also some Guyot, but uh, also the, for the production that we can make, uh, Pergola for us is better because uh, we can select also more the branches. So we, are, we have more selection for, for per, with, with the Pergola for, for our native grapes. Mm. And uh, no, we have uh, 42 hectares, so it's a big quantity. And uh, we have vineyards uh, from the valley, so it's like from uh, 100, 150 meters above the sea level uh, to arrive at 500 meters high uh, on the, the sea level, like this one, that is the best that we have, uh, that uh, in the, on the horizon there is the lake. Uh, so this is uh, in the last 10, 20 years uh, with the climate changing, so with this, uh, from the pollution, so the climate changing, the maturation uh, arrive uh, faster and uh, for the grape is not good because uh, also the humidity, there, there has been an increasing of the humidity. So uh, the consortium, so the parliament of Arpolicella decided to allow to plant vineyards uh, higher on the mountain to have uh, this uh, more ventilation, to have uh, the, um, to have the uh, as lower maturation of the grape as, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. 
So the... When, when did you buy your higher vineyard? Is that something you've had for a while or something that you've bought? Oh, we bought 15 years ago. Okay. There was a, a forest and uh, we decided to take out the trees, not all the trees, and to, the, to plant uh, vineyards uh, to have of, of more selection because uh, maturation is different in every, for every vine, literally. But uh, of course, uh, every vineyard is different uh, and to have a maturation uh, slower, we had to plant vineyards uh, more in the mountain, also with the more different of temperature between day and night. Uh, for all these aspects, very important to have uh, a lower maturation, a good uh, maturation of the grapes, uh, like one time. So, because I remember when I was uh, a child, the, the harvest was uh, at least at the end of September. We had years, uh, like uh, in the last 10 years, uh, some people started like the 1st of September. Yeah. So it's different is the one month. And so it's, it's not good because also uh, too warm, too humid. And uh, you know, the, there is a changing and also the vines uh, need to, to start to, not to think about this changing, but decide to, to be able to, to grow and to, without uh, stress and uh, to, to create a, a good fruit, a good grape. And when you were in California, did you see uh, any pergola there? Or, you know, what are they doing in California? No, I've never seen any pergola in California. They grow some, uh, also Corvina. I found the one guy that was trying to make it like a Marone style with, in California, but with, uh, with Cuyo. So pergola, we have pergola here. That okay. is called pergola veronese, so pergola from Verona. And uh, Pergola Trentina, that is a bit different, but is similar, so same concept. So there are just two, these two per kind of Pergola are the main, the main one used in Italy. And um, I, in California, no, in Australia, impossible, but uh, yeah, of course, uh, nothing. Did you see anything um, on your trips? On your and your work experience in California and Australia that you then brought back to the winery? Yes, there was something uh, here is a, like a chemistry stuff that uh, in California, they were really, really crazy to, for cleaning tanks uh, so to, because they have a lot of fire, so pollution in the hair, dust, uh, so they were very, very, very crazy for cleaning. So, and cleaning in the winery is the main thing to, to keep the, the wine clean at the end. So, and also they were using something that here was, was known for sure, was known, but uh, we used something else and that thing was better. So we decided to use this one to, okay. to make our wines. And uh, but California, of course, they are the best of, for the marketing. They are, I think, the best in the world. So we are very, we are far from there about marketing, but um, yeah, it was very, very interesting experience. Mm -hmm. yeah, and now the weird thing that I ever seen was in Australia. And this is quite funny. So it was so hot. It was like 46 degrees last year. And uh, I was going to, to work uh, and I saw the, this like cream, white cream on the vineyards. I say, what is that cream? I never seen like really cream on the, on the, uh, on the leaves. Uh, and the guy said, yeah, this, is, this year is too hot. So we have to put like a sunscreen to the vineyards because uh, otherwise they burn. So <laughs> yeah, it was really crazy. <laughs> And what was it? What, what, what were they doing? What were they putting on? Yeah, they put with the, with the tractor uh -huh. as they spray like copper or um, for the animals. Eh? They spray this like sort of cream uh, to protect the vines uh, from, the, from the burning of the sun. So yeah, it was uh, really new <laughs> for me. Yeah, I wonder what was in the cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is the wine you're speaking. So the main grape of Valpolicella are uh, literally is one. We have the main three here. 
And uh, as you can see, the main one is the first on the left, called, uh, it's called Corvina. And uh, Corvina is uh, the main grape of uh, Valpolicella. And uh, it's, uh, has a good skin, so it's perfect for the drying process. So as you can see here, we decided to have the pictures of the, the dry grapes. Uh, we have Corvina and Corvinone that is similar, but just bigger and maybe sometimes growing better than Corvina. We have after Rondinella that we use for the acidity and we have uh, uh, Molinara that we use from uh, like the complexity of the wine. And after we have other native grapes that we use uh, to, to reach the good balance of the wine. But uh, autochthon grapes are just Italian grapes. So we, we don't have autochthon grapes uh, like uh, Merlot, Cabernet, like the main in the world. Yeah, but uh, sure. we are allowed to use uh, for a bit in the wine if you want. But we use just uh, autochthon grapes from uh, Valpolicella. And there are no other parts of Italy, are there, that are growing these uh, grapes? Yeah. Sorry? No other parts of Italy at all are growing these grapes. It's quite specific to the to the Valpolicella. Yeah, quite specific you know. to just in Valpolicella. So in Italy is the place that has uh, more varieties in the world, uh, and uh, we have really like one thousand uh, or six hundred uh, different varieties of grapes, mm -hmm. and that's our strength. So because uh, every single region has different grapes, this is. Uh, are lucky we are lucky for that because we have this difference between difference of soil different of climate so that's been different kind of grapes and that's fantastic of course it's difficult for the people outside of italy understand all of these grapes because uh, the, the famous wine of italy are not 600 like 600 the variety of the, of the grapes but maybe people know and also me i, I don't know something that they produce maybe in Campania, that is really, really small, but maybe interesting, but uh, the difference is so big. So also it's difficult to taste everyone, to understand uh, everyone. But um, in Valpolicella is also more interesting because uh, we make the drying process mm -hmm. to make uh, the Amarone wine. So Valpolicella historically was born for the Recioto, so a dessert wine, a sweet wine. So to have uh, the, to produce this sweet wine, uh, the winemakers of Alpolicella decided to, uh, to get more sugar, to have more sugar, because uh, here we are not in Sicily, so the, where they have a lot of sun, so they have a lot of sugar in the grapes, as the orange, as the lemon, so they are fantastic over there, because they have a lot of sugar. Here, for the climate is different, so we have less sugar, so they say, okay, to get more sugar, what we can do, we can dry the grapes. So we pick the grapes, we dry the grapes. So the grapes uh, lose the water, 30% of the water, so we can increase the sugar content. So they make that and they produce uh, at the beginning risotto. So this dessert wine uh, really matching with dessert or uh, something like different, if you want to do like uh, cheese, a uh, cheese. Legend say that uh, one guy forgot this tank of uh, ricotta, so and all the sugar in the time became alcohol. So after he arrived, they say, okay, uh, this wine was sweet. Now it's not sweet anymore, but it's more alcoholic. But it's not sweet. So he said, no, it's bitter. It's very bitter, and uh, bitter in Italian is amaro. So it's very bitter, they say, okay, yeah, Amarone, and the story said Amarone was born for that, and uh, from there, the production completely changed, because now the 95% of the production is for the Amarone, and the Recioto is just 5%. So as we dry the grapes, we pick the grapes, we put the grapes uh, in these special buckets, and uh, in these special rooms, uh, with, where we control the temperature, we control the ventilation for the humidity, because we cannot have more, a lot of humidity, uh, because we don't want to like mildew and stuff that attack our grapes. And we leave uh, the grapes uh, there for three months. 
they get uh, an increasing of sugar of all the component, uh, the aromas component. And uh, after one month, the grapes are like this. So you can see the that is getting like more uh, more brown the clusters and a little bit more dry at the end. So after three months, the grapes look like this. So they are very very dry. The stems are completely brown. And uh, when we arrive at this point, so we check the grapes, we check especially the sugar content, we start to crush the grapes. We, uh, after that, we crush the grapes and uh, we ferment all in stainless steel. So to keep the freshness, to do not touch too much the wine. And uh, we ferment all in stainless steel. Uh, and after uh, we work with the wine a lot and of course because after three months so we have to crush the grapes for the Amarone in December and December is uh, January, December is cold so it's difficult also the fermentation is more difficult and um, so we take we need more time and uh, after that we age the wine in the barrel for uh, many years, depends on the wine. We use especially old barrels because we don't want to touch too much the wine with the oak because oak uh, cover a lot of stuff. So you need to, to find the right balance to, to keep the harmony because uh, if you have just oak, you cover too much what is the grape, what is the soil, what is the, the, the variety. So we use especially uh, old barrel for that. Of course, so we need, we have to age the wine, but we want to aging in a way where we can, where we can uh, keep the, we kind of keep the freshness. We want to keep uh, what is the grape, what is Valpolicella in the glass. And how would and, you, we have a question here. How, what would you, how would you describe this first wine on the nose? Of course, the first. Yeah. So the wine uh, that you are tasting is uh, the only one that is not making a drying process. And uh, we decided that, uh, why? Because, uh, you know, Valpolicella, we have Valpolicella, Ripasso, Amarone and Recioto. So four different kinds of wines. We have uh, in the Ripasso, in the Amarone, in the Recioto, we have the drying process. So we don't have the fresh cherry, for example, to understand, but we have the dry cherry. So we say, okay, if we have the dry cherry in three wines, in the first one, so the entry level, we want the fresh cherry. So we decided to, to we don't dry the grape. We pick the grapes like in any other part in the world. We crush the grapes immediately, ferment in stainless steel, and six months in, the, in the stainless steel, so not oak, because uh, we want to keep the freshness. And after two months in the bottle, uh, and after we release the wine to the market. So this is La Policella 2017. And uh, cheers to everyone. Cheers, everybody. So this is like, it's like when you arrive in a place and uh, uh, you have to, the first touch that you have. So this is, okay, I'm in Valpolicella. What is Valpolicella? Valpolicella is uh, Corvina grape, is pergola, as we said. So here we have a Valpolicella that I call this Valpolicella uh, raw wine because it's really Corvina, crush, not dry, stainless steel, keep the freshness. We keep the, so the, the picking is a bit earlier to keep the, the acidity more, to have this, to, to feel more this freshness. And uh, uh, not hockey to do not cover anything of Corvina. So this Valpolicella uh, is very, very fruity. So the main fruit that Corvina represent are uh, a ch cherry and uh, marasca. So it's a sort of amarena, so sort of cherry. And uh, so the fruitiness is concerned these two fruit. And here, I think we are very, very fresh, a bit more like concentration because 17 
was a warm vintage, so we didn't have too much cold in the winter as well. So we had more concentration, and uh, so here we are more powerful. But uh, I think the in the mouth is very we can feel a bit the sapid, so the the saltiness of the corvina because corvina is it's weird but has something really salty, and uh, but it's very harmonic, very dry, has a good body. It's not an aging wine, but has a good body. So a good warm in the mouth and the finish, I think is, we can feel a bit the acidity more. So it's not rounded like a ripasso, it's like a marone, like a ricciotto, of course, because also it's less sweet, but it's very long finish, but very clean and harmonic. And that's the main thing for us because we, our philosophy is really to keep, in we fact, are very traditional, maybe too much. In fact, it's great. I, I actually chose, um, just to explain to everybody, when I was choosing the wines for this, uh, for this evening, the reason that I wanted to, to choose this is because there are very few uh, producers in the Valpolicella that make a straight Valpolicella like it used to be. They're all going now for something that's dried, that's a bit more complex, a bit uh, more heavy, looks or sound, feels a bit like the a ripasso, a ripasso that people call uh, very often uh, is known as a baby amarone. So I want to... To, to choose two wines which were very, very different. And um, I think that when you get a nice Valpolicella made nicely, it's a perfect everyday wine. It goes with just about everything. You sit down, pizza, pasta, whatever, you can easily get through a bottle of um, Valpolicella. So that's why, that's why I chose uh, this one. I'd love for you to all tell us what you're what you're eating with the uh, with the Valpol if you've got that out, um, and then Angelo, somebody has a question here for the uh, Amarone. What sort of glass would you uh, recommend for it? For the Amarone, the balloon, uh -huh. know, the balloon or grand balloon is the perfect one for, for the, the Amarone. Biggest glass you can find. Uh, yeah, that's the main one. So. And for Vapolicella, I don't know the name, but like, like a, this one, so the classic one, or not, not a big, uh, huge... Uh, one one yeah. glass of it, so yeah. how long did you stop? Vapolicella is a, an entry-level wine, so it's a, an easy drinking wine for us. It's a fruity and refreshing wine, so that's why it's the first of the line. So, and... Um, it's uh, really to start to discover Corvina, Barpolicella, raw like this, is, I think is, we can understand. And uh, I don't know if you are agree with what I said about the taste, because everyone had different tastes. So, and that's the best thing because uh, uh, everyone can feel something that I cannot feel because maybe I used to, to, to feel the same. Uh, and uh, so that's why it's also interesting what you think about the, the Barpolicella. I have a question, well, another question for you. Did, uh, at any point, was, was Valpolicella bottled in the uh, uh, Fiasco bottles, the, the ones that were used for Chianti? With no, the we didn't. On? No. No, no, no. no. That's okay. a typical, uh, like, Tuscany yeah, stuff. So. Yeah, they make, uh, say, someone maybe try to do it, uh, but not really as a big market, stuff like that here. But uh, yeah, no, but Priscilla, maybe so. Also, the, the label of this, we are we can, I think, also beginning at the beginning from the label. Uh, I mean, you can see that we are our style, so our winery is very, very traditional, very classic. So, maybe for someone too much, for someone it's yeah, it's nice, but uh, yeah, our we are really, really traditional and uh, very, very. <clears throat> classic style maybe also too much uh, I say sometime because uh, we don't have any whites so we produce just uh, six wines just six red wine of our policella so what we are used to make since the beginning since my, my grandfather start to, started to buy vineyards and to make wine so and also this is not easy because you know in a in a world like this, uh, when sometimes people think about, you know, we have to have everything so that that the restaurant choose us, take everything, white, sparkling, 
and a lot of winery do that and uh, it's not wrong but for us it's impossible because uh, we, we used to work with this grape we used to work in this place so we cannot make anything different because we are not able to do it so and that's uh, i think is our strength so i like uh, to we work just with uh, with restaurants and also for this reason uh, we this period especially is uh, very very difficult and uh, also for example is if uh, one year like 2014 was a really bad vintage because what's a wet vintage so 90 days of summer 60 days was rain and my father said okay i think uh, this year we cannot make wine i say what so i was studying at the time and say no 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 wine why it's not why but i could imagine why but i say okay it's very very difficult choice also economically because if you don't make Which, vintage, sorry, which year was this this was the 14. Oh yeah, 14, disaster, yeah. Uh, also 99 uh, and 2002, yeah. we didn't do the, the Amarone, we didn't do Ripasso, we didn't make Recioto, uh, but we saved just uh, the fresh grapes to make a Papolicella and that's it. Um, we've, we've, it's funny, we've talked about, uh, you've mentioned Ripasso, but um, I'd like you just to go over how Ripasso is made because in fact, there's a question about the uh, quantities and the quantities of wine that you can make are sort of dependent on each other, aren't you? Because you can dry a quantity. Mm -hmm. You can dry a, a certain quantity of grapes to make then uh, Amarone. And from those Amarone uh, skins, you can make then only a certain amount, can't you? Of of Ripasso. So can you just explain that for us, please? Um, so we, we, um, so we can pick, we have to start really from the base. And so you can understand very, very good. And uh, we can pick uh, every year, they decide how much grapes, how much kilos we can pick. And uh, this year they choose 10,000 kilo of grapes for one hectare. So one hectare is like two football soccer field. For two soccer, two, no, it's like a square of 100 meters. Mm -hmm. It's one hectare. For one hectare, we can pick 10,000 kilo of grapes. Mm -hmm. But just 45%, uh, so less than a half. So it's like 400 uh, and 4,500 kilos, less than a half. Uh, we can dry to make the Amarone. Okay. For the rest, so the other half, a little bit more, we use for Valpolicella. So we, we make Valpolicella with the, the half fresh grapes that we pick. We dry the other half that we can dry. Mm -hmm. And after, so if you have, for example, 100 liters of Amarone, with uh, that uh, 4,500 4, kilos, you can make the double of Ripasso. So if you have one liter of Amarone, you can yeah. do two liters of Ripasso. So let me just briefly explain for anybody who doesn't know how you make, um, just to go over, how you make Ripasso is you make Valpolicella and then yeah, you... With you grapes and we, we live in the tank. You put it, on then the skins after, of after we wait uh, that uh, the grapes are dry we crush the grapes for the amarone mm -hmm. we ferment the amarone at the end of the fermentation we drain the juice so the wine but we leave the skins of course the skins are wet because they were mixed in the wine we leave the skins in the tank and uh, we put uh, in the same tank uh, the Valpolicella Classico that we already fermented before with the fresh grapes. We put uh, in the tank uh, with the skins of the Amarone. And after that uh, started uh, a little bit, uh, another small fermentation. And so it's like uh, passing uh, the Valpolicella Classico, so the fresh and fruity Valpolicella, with the skins of the Amarone. So it's like uh, passing the Valpolicella and other time on the skins of the Marone, and that's in Italian, it's a uh, ripasso for that.
Exactly. That's why also they call uh, Baby Amarone. And uh, so Ripasso is the main wine that the most sold wine in Valpolicello, of course, because we have double quantity compared with Amarone. And uh, Amarone, of course, we have a small, small quantity and also the price is higher. So Ripasso is uh, really in the middle between the Valpolicella and the Amarone and people enjoy also with the meal. So it's not so alcoholic, it's not so powerful. And in fact, there's lots of, lots of Ripasso is sold in, uh, in Germany, isn't it? And very often people see Ripasso as like a, a baby Amarone. So the, it's taken on some structure when it's done that second fermentation with the skins of the Amarone, um, but it's not quite as alcoholic or even as expensive as a Amarone because you're also not aging it for, for all that long, but it's got more than the, the classic. So it's a bit in the middle. I know there's, there's lots of it that's sold in, in Germany um, because it's a very often a very good um, sort of price point for, for what you get. So, for uh, Yeah, yeah, Ripasso is the, the right choice between if you don't want a really too much easy drinking wine, or you don't want a too much like powerful alcoholic wine you choose repass so you are in the middle way you have a very very good wine so good body good structure more more color more intensity and uh, but not as too maybe strong or too impen too too alcoholic uh, as uh, an amarone so it's the the right choice and also ripasso is uh, you can drink it uh, like with first course, uh, you can drink it also with some meat, uh, maybe not like wild or strong taste meat, uh, but uh, it is not a bad choice. So, and um, we've talked on a, on a few occasions about um, how people are going towards sort of low alcohol wines. Um, how many bottles of the Valpolicella Classico do you, do you produce? Now, what's the, can you tell us the breakdown of uh, out of your 220,000 that you produce every year, how many of each wine do you make? Yeah, so we make in total six wines, Vaporicella Classico. Uh, we make uh, around 50,000 bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, Aripasso, we produce uh, around 100,000. Okay. So it's uh, almost double. And uh, we make two different Amarone and uh, one regular, so that they just in a big barrel and one age, uh, so this one that the guys have uh, at their home. Uh, half uh, in the big barrel and half barrick. Uh, so by, in total, I uh, have 50,000 bottles uh, of Amarone, 30,000 for the regular and 20,000 for the Amarone Ambrosan, so the wine that you have there. And so the quantity of Marone is very, very is small, of course, but uh, it's more value, more, of course, more, uh, <clears throat> the price is higher. After 6,000 bottles of Recioto, mm -hmm. so the, the market of Recioto is very, very tiny. Uh, and after we produce one IGT, it's called uh, Testal, and is the rest of the bottle. It's like, uh, depends uh, but around 40,000 bottles and that is just Cordina so it's the extraction of Cordina grape uh, but not like Valpolicella but uh, with a wine with more body and uh, more structure more calcul uh, percentage and uh, yeah so, so this I, is I was product. going to say if if uh, with the way that this is made if you find that one day your your market drops it slightly for for Amarone you've still got to produce that amount of Amarone because that's the amount of Amarone you've got to produce to make sure you've still got your 100,000 bottles of Ripasso, isn't it? Excuse me, but I didn't hear very well. Sorry. For... Even um, you, because of how the production uh, methods are all intertwined, if, yeah. your, if, your de if your demand for Amarone one day would decrease um, or even increase, that you say it decreases, you've still got to produce 50,000 bottles of Amarone to make sure you've got the 100,000 bottles of Ripasso that you, yeah. you know you can sell. So it's, it, you're in a, like, really quite a tricky situation as a Valpolicella producer yeah. because yeah. It, they're all so, you know, they're so linked. Yeah, but uh, we have 42 hectares, so 
we could produce uh, uh, more than this, like the double, without okay. problem. And with 42 hectares, we have uh, a big quantity of grapes, but uh, we really select from the valley, medium valley, high valley, like almost mountain, as you saw before. And so we really select the best grapes for us, uh, and the rest uh, we produce and sell as a bulk wine. Ah, okay. And, yeah, so we could uh, make a more selection if the demanding of the wine will be will increase in the years uh, or uh, if for example if a winery doesn't have much uh, much vineyards much grapes they can uh, start to plant new vineyards if they are allowed so there are just these ways or they have to to buy wine but of course it's better to plant vineyard to make your own wine your own grape so that's the best thing so for us it's not a problem because uh, we can change the selection so we can uh, start to <clears throat> to have more quantity of Marone, more quantity of Ripasso. Of course, we can arrive at a limit and after, after that limit, we cannot go because we, can, we want to keep the high quality. So you arrive at the point that you have to stop it. If you, if you, if you continue, of course, you have to 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 use uh, maybe more quantity with less quality of course the quality is going down so we have to fact, didn't they didn't they recently change the amount of ripasso you could make from the skins of the amarone yeah it's uh, so you now make... you can make more ripasso so it's like more than the double okay a little bit more to preserve so using uh, uh, more amarone so to leave it more skins to understand in the tank yeah and uh, so because we they want to keep uh, the quantity of amarone low yeah. because yeah. low quantity high price if yeah. you have a lot of quantity of amarone the price of course is going will go down so yeah. you, have to keep, you have to keep the quantity the quantity small the quantity down to have a good price of the market and uh, so that's the way I think is the, it's the most difficult thing is to keep the same bottle and to increase the price. Okay. So that's a game that saved the denomination, saved the appellation because uh, we cannot start tomorrow to make uh, one euro a Marone. But uh, of course, if you buy a one euro a Marone, you know that maybe the quality is not the best. And also for the image of the denomination, the appellation, the image of Italy is not good. So we have to really try to keep this quantity. So also now for planting new vineyards is almost impossible because uh, we, had, we are arrived at 8,000 hectares in Barpolicella and to me is just, is already not too much, but uh, we have to preserve the quantity and the, the quality and the price of the wine to, to remain one of the best three wines in Italy and one of the top 10 wines in the world. So that's the way for me <clears throat> absolutely but i find this you know this i think it's it's very particular uh, peculiar particular to, to the valpolicella is the fact that you're making four you four wines out of essentially the same grapes in the in the vineyards and you're deciding and you have that whole sort of economic decision to to make and or oh, if i want to make that then i've got to use the grapes there and and there, that's very particular there's no other region in the in the world that has that choice that makes the same sort of uh, wines from the same grapes and has all that to think about you know usually people just make grapes and make wine and you know yeah. they change the yeah. style but not you know so that the way yeah, it's uh, very very nice because um, it's like you have a piece of meat cooking four different ways so and uh, that's very very interesting because we have a policella so this one in a Corvina, in a way, you have Ripasso, another way, you have uh, Marone, another way, so you have the, the, the top, and after Recioto, another way too, so it's very interesting, very unique, I think, also the method that we use, and uh, also the technology, how it's increased in the years, and um, it's very, very interesting to see how 
you can what you can do really just different techniques to with just one grape so i think it's very 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 unique and also unique also for the place and for the climate that we have here because if you try with another grape if you try in another place uh, i think it's also difficult to do it and a lot of people tried but it's really it's uh, from Valpolicella and uh, that's and it. How, how was the Corvina that you found in, in California? You said that somebody was planting Corvina uh, there. Uh, it was like a big wine, so like, California, like more Napa style, so you know, big cab or beer, big uh, Merlot, big Syrah that they have there. So was, uh, yeah, maybe also. Not, not too strong, but uh, I don't I don't remember if uh, it was just Corvina. I think it was something also with more color because the color was really <clears throat> really intense. And uh, also Amarone is yeah the color is intense, but it's not like a Merlot or a Cabernet. So if you find uh, some Amarone that are very very dark, uh, maybe Corvina is, is not uh, the darkest uh, or most red grape in the world, so the color. Yeah. Can you tell us? We've got a question about the the uh, blends. You're actually limited, aren't you? In in the sort of minimum and maximum that the Corvino or Corvinone has got to be in your blend, and then how much of the other uh, local varieties you can have. Yeah. So for the rules, uh, we can uh, <clears throat> use uh, from thirty five to 95% of Corvina. But uh, you will find a maximum of 70% in the DOC wines, so in the Amarone, in the Aripasso, in Vapolicella. But that's because uh, people doesn't have much Corvina to do a 95% Corvina Amarone. Yeah. So that's why also maybe they decided to use in the blend also other grapes and that uh, autochthon grapes. So of this uh, 35% uh, minimum, 95% maximum of Corvina, we can use uh, half, so 50% of this percentage, Corvinone. Which is a fatty version of Corvina. Yeah, it's like the yeah, fatty version, and, uh, but uh, it's growing better, growing always better. Yeah. Because, uh, we have uh, also more concentration, uh, also for the aromatic, for the bouquet. You have a lot of more like pepper compared with the Corvina. So in the blend is perfect. It's also fantastic to have like these two different grapes, but they are like different and uh, perfect together. So one compares the other one. So it's, uh, it's like to have two Merlot. It's uh, better than one, I think for sure. And uh, after for, with the, for the rules, we can use uh, from 5% to 30% of uh, rondinella. And we use especially rondinella uh, for the acidity because it doesn't have too much color, uh, doesn't have too much like uh, aromas or something that we want in our bouquet. But in the blend is good because it helps Corvina for the acidity and it's fantastic. After we can, we have another 25% that is uh, uh, 15% it's grapes that are allowed to plant uh, in the province of Verona but they could do uh, the foreign grapes so they, we, you can put for example Merlot, Cabernet and uh, Sierra if it's allowed to Verona but uh, in a blend of 5% so it's like 15, 5, 5, 5 or 10 plus 5 of these grapes that are not really autochthon grapes of Verona. And and does, after, does anybody use things like uh, Merlot and Syrah? Uh, no, Syrah, I don't think, uh, I, don't, I, I don't, I I said Syrah just to say another one, international. Uh, it's allowed, I know it's allowed, but I've never, I can't think of any winery that I know that. Um, yeah, Cabernet and Merlot are uh, for sure allowed. Yeah. And uh, people, I think, use, yeah, use for the color especially because uh, they, are, they have more color and so help for the international taste, the color of the Amarone. Of course, if you think an Amarone, you think uh, on a strong wine. Yeah. 
and sometimes that is not correct because strong what means strong strong mean if we, we are talking about alcohol yes it's strong but if we are talking about color is not true because merlot could be less alcohol but it's more more strong in color so they use for the color and uh, because uh, with the drying process of corvina uh, the bouquet is is that so it's difficult to to put more some other fruits for example because you have the dry plum you have the dry blueberry you have the dry cherry so they are they are strong so it's difficult to cover them with something else or something some other fruits that come from grapes that are not dried so and um, and uh, somebody's just asked, we were talking about the Corvina that you saw in, in California. Can you remember which winery that was? No, I don't remember, but I can find because um, I was a friend of a uh, friend of mine. So that was um, Ali, and, Ali and Patrick had that. So. Yeah, I was an Italian guy. That's the funny thing. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Italian guy that was missing Italy and <laughs> he decided to do a Corvina in California. We had uh, we had once a Grignolino uh, from California, and it was amazing. My husband still remembers that wine, how good it was. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it can be. Yeah, they, they, they grow a lot of Italian varieties as well. So, but California to, to me is, uh, I think, the best in the world uh, after Italy. So, was I don't know why I have California in my heart because that was my first experience outside Italy in another winery. But I really fall in love with California. If uh, California, after Italy, for me, there is California. Yeah. And how long, uh, another question for you, how long would you keep this Valpolicella for? Uh, Valpolicella, it's easy drinking, so you can keep it for a couple of three years, uh, yeah. but not more. Uh, yeah, it's, because, not, it's not made for. Yeah, if you wait more, you, you lose the freshness, you lose the fruitiness. Uh, so it's a wine that you have consumed soon. So exactly. Where is the, the Amarone? How long? Life is not so long. So yeah. How how long would you keep the uh, Ambrosan for? How how old is yeah, all this Ambrosan you have? Maybe Ambrosan uh, can live more than me. Or <laughs> but uh, yeah, there isn't a, a date for the Amarone. Has Barolo has uh, a lot of strong wines. Of course, uh, if you give uh, to someone a bottle of Amarone uh, 29, uh, maybe it's not good. So I could say that 80% is not good. But uh, when I was in Australia, I, I drank an Amarone mm -hmm. in Australia. It was 77. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. I was really surprised because uh, I always thought that Amarone, yeah, of course, like, after 20 years, uh, it's still fantastic. Uh, but uh, I say maybe, I don't know, 40 is starting to be a long time. So, but that Palpolite Tamarone 77 was really fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, it dep depends a lot of stuff, depend of the cork, if the cork is good. And uh, if you keep the, the wine stuck in your winery at the right temperature and lie down, for 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 40 years 50 years uh, yeah could survive for sure and uh, it could be maybe the best uh, amarone that you ever tried so so did you enjoy the wines yes. yeah, yeah. yeah very nice very nice so what what did you did you did you try both of them or just the Policella, just the Marone or both? All of you? <laughs> I tried the Valpolicella with the pizza. It goes very well. Oh, with the pizza. <laughs> yeah, I love the matching with the pizza, but with the with Valpolicella is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, pizza is a kind of food that we will you we could match with uh, a lot of also different wines uh, you can have different ingredients on the pizza so i'm used to, to drink wine with the pizza beer of course but... uh, i have one one question to the to the valpolicella yeah. because uh, 
the, the, the style of the wine, uh, of, of a red wine, is uh, much more um, uh, regarded to the wines we have in the, in the north. So it's not that um, that bodied wine, that um, it's, a, it's a very light red wine. So some of the people also in our bre breakout room, it was were a little bit Oh, that's uh, interesting. That was a little bit not un, uh, a little bit unexpected uh, red wine. Yeah. So yeah. is it uh, is it con concerning the, the the vintage of the of the wine or is it um, is it a, a style you prefer? No, I think it's it's concerned the the style of the philosophy of this Valpolicella because uh, of course uh, maybe you are use drink a Valpolicella with more body, with uh, not this uh, freshness, but stronger, maybe with also different evolution of the fruit, not just really fresh cherry, but maybe more dry. So a wine that you could uh, compare with wine with more body, with more structure. But uh, for us to have a different wine to start in the line, we, we choose to do have this fresh, this refreshing, this easy drinking, to fruity wine because uh, we have all the rest after in the other wines. So, and for who tried the, the Ambrosan, of course, Valpolicella is the first, Ambrosan is the last. So there is a world between. And uh, so you pass from the Valpolicella, very clean, very clean. Young and fresh to the Amaro that is completely the opposite, so the whole body very complex, high cycle. But uh, the most important thing is if you drink our lines from the first to the last, all the lines, so to increasing passing from the Marpolicella to the the Amarone, you can feel that the hand is the same, you can feel that that harmony that you have. We have been all the wines. Different way, of course, because Amarone is stronger. But uh, so this, uh, this Valpolicella, I think, is very, very balanced, very harmonic, very delicate. And uh, for us, that's the most important thing because you can have uh, the best grapes, the best tanks, the best of everything. But if you don't have uh, harmony, you lose something. And ar with harmony, you get uh, one hundred percent of everything, of the grapes, of the aging. Of yeah, that's what we thought. Um, just to explain our experience, it was that uh, the balance um, between uh, acidity and uh, um, tannins uh, is, is very good. So it was a for us, it was a nice, nice, nice red wine. But um, it was for the for the it was more typical northern uh, red wine so that what we usually expect for a, a pinot noir uh, yeah yeah because you are used to drink like more powerful also more intense and more colorful by policella but uh, yeah. because uh, this is not dry this is really as i said is a raw by policella so Grapes, uh, we picked the grapes, fresh grapes, immediately crushed, stainless steel, just stainless steel. So, and we like this, we, we want this because uh, we make a drying process, we make aging in barrel with all the others. So why do we have to do the same also in this one? So mm. we need something different. So, and also we don't have any white. So for us, this is our white. Ah, okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Well, this is a joke, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. It's and like the, the appetizer, you know. So to arrive at the second course, third course, you need to start with something that is not too strong. Thank you. You're welcome. We have uh, Colin that has a, uh, Colin's put his hand up and so is Marvin. Marvin, I'm coming to you in a minute. I'm just going to unmute Colin because- I'm unmuted, I'm unmuted already. Yeah, the reason why I put you on mute, I can see that when you put your hand up is because otherwise everybody gets an echo back through and um, that's- so I can't explain that, but okay. No, it's um, not you, it's everybody. I'm talking to everybody in general. That's why okay. I 
you put your hand up and then I'll come to you. Cool. Okay. Right, ask us the question, Holly. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to know what your export is like. I mean, to, to, to how many countries do you export? And I just wanted to say that um, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of Amarone. I've drunk Amarone for several years now. Yeah. And it's, it's an excellent wine. Um, but I was just wondering how, what your reach is. Okay, so but we export uh, eighty percent of the production. Mm. Wow! Main market uh, is uh, U.S. Uh, in order, we have uh, Canada, second one. We have uh, Europe in general, Italy, and also we are working. We are increasing our work in uh, North South Wales travels, of course, before the period in Asia. Mm. So. I think we are exporting in 70% of the world. Wow. Because in Asia, we work in Thailand, we work in the Philippines, we work in Singapore, in China, Japan, Australia, uh, mm. Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So, yeah, of course, the quantity is not increasing like a huge increasing because it's yeah. also for us, it's not, uh, we cannot because our. Yeah, we can grow, but with a limit to keep the quality. And uh, of course, uh, the Asia market is not as big as US, of course, mm -hmm. but it's increasing because people uh, are into more interesting every day in discovering wines. Uh, and uh, the most difficult is always China because China, you have uh, a contract with the culture because mm -hmm. China, uh, People, the, the first time that I've been in China was with my father five years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was before, no, we were at a dinner and uh, <clears throat> the people, uh, yeah, okay, appetizers. They started with Mapolicella, after we had Ripasso, after we had um, mm -hmm. the first Amarone, and after uh, they order uh, with the second course, uh, they order tea with the meat. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Looking, my father said, uh, I think it will be difficult to tell Amarone to them. <laughs> but to, to teach them to drink wine with the meat because they are used to drink tea with the meat. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, the, the contrast is difficult. It's not easy, and uh, most of them they don't speak English, so they speak the Chinese. Yeah. So, if you go there to promote. Uh, uh, to something like uh, Expo, Wine Heavy Expo, something like that. Uh, yeah, you are there, and it's the most important thing, but you need a translator, so you need a guy that speaks for you, and uh, you don't even understand what the people ask to him, and you don't even understand what he's saying to them. So, yeah, okay. hmm. uh, yeah you are just an image there. And, uh, it's still difficult, yeah. but uh, it's hmm. increasing there because there are Thanks to the, all the Italian guy, to the Italian importer that are there and they're working very hard every day to teach them that there are a lot of wines to for different moments and uh, so it's uh, important to, to keep going and to keep traveling there to, to, to teach them uh, uh, which is our our culture. So try to sell the best that we have like pizza, like uh, everything. So. Can I ask a supplementary question? Um, I, I've been in Australia quite a bit. Where were you in Australia when you visited the country? So I worked for Yalamba in uh, Barossa Valley. Ah, okay. Yeah, and in Angaston. I was in Tananda, but the winery Yalumba is in uh, Angaston. Mm -hmm. And I uh, worked there in uh, last year. So the the vintage uh, 19 mm -hmm. and uh, for three years yeah and uh, our importer is living in the same town so in Canada is a small That's importer good. but uh, yeah, we are happy to to be in Australia too so mm -hmm. we put the flag and after of course we have to blow the wind but <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly we need the flag great Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Emma, you, you asked me also with cheese or what? I remember. No, Marvin, Marvin's also got a question now. So if Marvin's still there because uh, he's taking his video off. That's right. Uh, 
It's still there, mm -hmm. right? Yes, so I'm still there. Yes, hi. hi. Uh, just, a, just a question for you, um, Angelo. If you are hosting a blind tasting event, do you agree that the Valpolicello is really very difficult to identify because of its acidity? Um, I certainly find it difficult because you don't have this strong aroma. You cannot easily find this three unique grape you are talking about. What is your experience in this? Yeah, so blind tasting is very, very difficult because uh, I did uh, not a lot of times, but I did a couple of times, with, especially with friends, not for work. My father was used to, to make more blind tasting. And of course, uh, you need a lot of experience and you need uh, uh, to have tasted a lot of wines because that's the main thing. So, and also it's difficult to remind in your memory that aroma, so to link that aroma to that wine and remember that style is from there. So of course, after you difficult to understand and to, to guess the winery, but you need something to, re, to, to remind the, in your mind that is just in, that could be just your, just yours. Yeah. To remind that Chianti is something that, so you remind that Chianti is Chianti, but it's incredible. So it's, I think one of the most difficult thing because also, uh, in general, people are not used, they use nose because they breathe, because they go around. So if someone, uh, if it's raining, after rain, if someone cut uh, the grass in the garden, you feel it. But not because you are thinking about that, because you just feel it, because it's very strong. So, and using the nose is, uh, I think it's one of the most difficult things to recognize because uh, I also bought, uh, um, a box of 88 aromas uh, when I was studying and it's crazy because uh, if you close your eyes and someone put you like the, the skin of the lemon uh, look easy look super easy but uh, in your mind you cannot you the difficultness is to link the, that aroma that you know for sure but you cannot link you cannot find like you cannot say the name of that and uh, it's difficult, but uh, we try to do a lot because uh, it's important to, to recognize, uh, so to understand the different wines, but uh, it's also difficult because there are so many styles about one kind of wine. So yeah. you can have uh, five different Valpolicella and those five different Valpolicella could be similar to other 15 different uh, Grenache or Pinot Noir or uh, Etna Rosso or uh, whatever. Of course, uh, uh, there are some kind of stuff uh, that uh, make them different, and, uh, but you need a lot of experience to do that. Really, really a lot. Uh, and so years and years of tasting, uh, and uh, it, I think it's just experience and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of tasting, tasting wines. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's one of the funniest things for me. Yeah. But if you com if you compare this with Beaujolais, I would immediately pick up the Beaujolais. Anybody yeah. can, but with the Valpolicella, I find it very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah, especially yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially also, you see this so fruity and so yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's difficult also because with the uh, Beaujolais, also the yeah, the climate is different. We are not so far from each other, so. Uh, yeah. Is more easier. It's more easy. It's easier, sorry, to understand the difference between, for example, a Valpolicella and maybe a Southern Italy wine because uh, they don't have acidity. We have a lot of acidity, but with the Beaujolais, yeah, it's uh, more difficult because the acidity is the same. So in the mouth, yeah, there are some difference, but uh, not so clear like with other wines from other regions far further. So yeah, it's. Very, 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 very difficult. Thank you. But it's the most important thing because if you if you can recognize it, uh, it's uh, that's mean that you understood in your mind what the, what uh, what is that remind you that wine that is correct. So it's like you win or you you find the the way. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. I'm You're welcome. Angelo, would you like to tell us uh, something about the Amarone? 
for the people who've got it. Yeah, so Amarone Ambrosanna is uh, so our flag. So we can say that it's the best wine that we produce, so the most important. And uh, so for this one, uh, Ambrosanna is historically a place uh, close to our winery. And uh, we bought that uh, is one of the first vineyards that we bought at the time. And uh, it's called Ambrosan, the, the plot, and now also the street around this plot. And so we decided to, to use that grape at the beginning to, to dry and to make this special Amarone. And of course, we call it Ambrosan. Ambrosan, uh, the drying process is longer than the usual process, the usual uh, drying, because we dry for four months. And uh, after we ferment in stainless steel, all our fermentation are spontaneous, are natural, natural fermentation. So we don't use any inoculation of yeast, but we just use the natural. So we, we crush and we don't do anything about the yeast. So we use natural yeasts. And um, after we age the wine in uh, half in the big barrel, and half in barrique, so one third of the barrique are new and the others are old. And after we do one year in the bottle before to release the wine in the market. In that year, me and my father, we taste the wine frequently and when for us it's ready, we start to sell it. So as you can see, this one is 2010 and so it's a 10 years Samarone uh, now and uh, we is the current vintage of this kind of Amarone. For the, the other one is 2013. So our philosophy is to leave a lot the wine in the in the winery because uh, you know Amarone so these kind of big wines uh, need time to develop uh, so they need time also to for the stabilization they need uh, a lot of time you cannot go fast with them so that's why we leave the wine a lot and uh, that's why uh, <clears throat> we have this vintage in the market now. So for, for who have this wine in the glass, uh, for me this Amarone, it's, uh, yeah, it's very, very, it's a powerful Amarone because it's 16 alcohol percent. So but at the same time, it's very elegant, harmonic and delicate. We don't have too much oak, so you don't feel too much oak, and that's what we want because we want to keep what is Corvina, what is dry Corvina. And, uh, but we have uh, a huge complexity, and uh, what I feel, for example, all the time is cloves. Cloves, for me, is, uh, I don't know, all the time that I taste Ambrosan, I feel that. And, um, we have a, a huge complexity, so it's a wine that uh, we need time for drink to drink it because uh, we have to give it time to to open it and to change a lot. But uh, what I think is not as strong as you that you think about an Amarone. And uh, so it's at the same time it's drinkable. So you drink one glass and uh, you want to drink another one, and that's for us is the most important thing because. You can have the, the strongest, the best, whatever wine in the world, but it's wine, so you have to drink it. It's not a picture that you have just to collect it. You have to drink it, you have to enjoy it, you have to drink one glass, uh, and you, you have to order another one glass, so that's, the, the harmony is everything. I think that that's, uh, that's the biggest challenge with Amarone, um, is that you want to finish the bottle, and this is very easy to finish the bottle. And as I was saying to uh, one of the breakout rooms I was in, I chose this wine because my lovely husband loves this wine. This is his favourite wine. It is. Of all time. <laughs> um, and in fact, the funny story about is this is the day before we got married, I came to see your, your dad and said, where is Giuseppe? He's not come to say hello yet. Has he? He's, uh, he's arrived and uh, it was a surprise, but he's here. So <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Well, he, was, he was checking me here, he was checking me behind the wall, so... Ah, okay, so you were the... Uh, I've seen. Oh. Ciao, Giuseppe! 
Grazie. Oh, hey. Come stai? Molto Ciao. bene, molto bene. Tutto bene? Sì, sì, tutto a posto, tutto a posto. Ho bisogno di uno che parla italiano, che io sono potente su questo. <laughs> In fact, I have to tell everybody that I, I know Giuseppe because we, I organized some, some events with him many years ago and I would give him a hand. We were in London one time at the decanter, decanter event and I'd give him a hand and end up standing there selling his wine to everybody. I had so much fun. Um, so, yeah, so uh, as, what's, your fa what's your famous uh, phrase that you like to say, Giuseppe? Che i, i vini sono meglio che il tuo inglese? I, I hope my wine is better than my English. <laughs> <laughs> <Voilà. laughs> this is my phrase normally when I begin to speak English a little. Yeah. No, uh, good evening all. Uh, I hope uh, the wine is you like. I wanted to make a congratulation for making this uh, presentation wine of the uh, with, by the computer. Uh, for the moment it's not possible make a wine with the computer. I have to stay here and uh, work uh, on the cellar every day and uh, physical work uh, only. But uh, I appreciate a lot this uh, system, the new system, and, uh, but uh, uh, I prefer speak English, Angelo, because speak better than me. Uh, I know only 100 words in English. <laughs> But uh, 12 is a number and the other 88 uh, is a word. <laughs> Sorry for the people answer me, but uh, <laughs> um, if you have a particular question, I answer uh, and uh, Angelo translate me if you don't understand me. Or if I uh, translate me if you have uh, any question in particular. Yeah, I, I was telling everybody that this is my husband's favorite wine and that the day before we got married, I drove to your winery and asked you for a voucher for uh, a case of uh, six bottles of 2012. So uh, we're just waiting for the 2012 to be ready and then we're going to come down and pick it up. That was his wedding present, one of his wedding presents. Yeah, for the 12. Uh, still, still a bit of time to wait. Yeah, there is a bit to wait. Uh, <laughs> When will it be ready? I'm interested in that particular thing. Well, we have the, in fact, Paul and Pauline have just said that they have the 2009, but I think um, that was the, the, there were only three bottles um, that Benny had uh, left when uh, we first started this and he sent those out. And I have the, I have the 10. Um, I presume everybody else who has the duo probably has the 10. So yes. Okay. Now is the 10. The 11 is, uh, we bottled the 11 one year ago. Okay. So we are going to release it to the market, the 11. And uh, the 12, uh, for sure, another year, year and a half for the 12. So Christmas 22. Good. Christmas 22. December 22 will be there, if not before. Autumn 22. Yeah, yeah, 22 we will be the 12 yes <laughs> wonderful thank you per welcome. perfect is anybody who has opened this bottle does anybody want to tell us what they think to this yeah Faye, we, we've opened our 2009 amarone mm -hmm. we're enjoying it even my son he uh i said to him at the beginning of the evening i said you're not getting much of the second wine because it's far too good <laughs> <laughs> and um, he liked it so much that he's had a bit more of it. <laughs> After very nice. Yes, very nice. The, the 2010 is also very good. Ah, okay. it's it's as good as all the other Amarones I've ever tasted. It's really good. Yeah, I I, I can't drink too much of it. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll drink some more tomorrow. Own. I promise. Yeah, on your own. No, this is it. It's good for the for keeping to really be able to appreciate it. I think. Yeah, of course, uh, always saying that, yeah, it's harmonic, it's drinkable, but if you drink uh, a bottle uh, and you stand up, uh, I think you immediately sit again, so. <laughs> <laughs> but if, wow. in English, we say it's very moorish. You keep wanting to drink more and more and more. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Oops. yeah, uh, we hope that uh, every, every vintage um, climate allow, allow, so we try to do that better every year and uh, for example for us uh, 
the best vintage ever of the Amarone and Brosan was uh, 2004. In 2004, uh, we get listed in the top 100 wines in the world of uh, Wine Spectator with the Ambrosan 2004. So for us, was really is the best hour that we got in, in the, our history. And uh, so really care about this kind of wine, also all the other, of course. But of course, this one is our flag and is our you know our presentation. If we have to to play our best card. Beautiful, well done. It's really nice. Okay. Thanks to Giuseppe because me, I'm just drinking for now. So, <laughs> <laughs> work with me at uh, Make Wine together. I'm a very uh, have a lot of uh, satisfaction because to taste it together with the, my son, I I love this uh, continuation. Continuation. Yeah, continuation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because uh, I have uh, a lot of passion of uh, producing wine, but in uh, the next uh, 10 years, maybe. <laughs> I am retired. <laughs> <laughs> in 10 years, to learn everything. Yeah. In talking about that, I, I was, when you, uh, I, your, I remember your, you said that your father died, died early, so, so you basically then have been able to do things as you wanted through the winery. How do you think it's going to be when Angelo takes over? Um, there's always that sort of moment, isn't there, where um, the generations change and it can be a bit complicated. Um, do you think you'll be ready to sort of say, okay, I'm going to retirement, up to you. How do you think it'll be? Not to completely generation. Cioè la, Scusate un attimo. Il nonno è morto giovane. Sì. Quindi tu hai iniziato subito a fare, eccetera. Dopo invece adesso pian piano mi stai insegnando a me come pensi che sia il passaggio. Sì, ecco, sì, vabbè, lo dico in italiano che mi risulta meglio, ecco. Eh no, il passaggio è molto meglio perché si riesce addirittura a lavorare insieme, guardare le analisi, vedere, pigiare l'uva, decidere quando fare i trafasi, quanto rimane sulle fece, tutte queste cose che facciamo tutti i giorni, è veramente molto interessante per me e per lui. Interessante per me perché vedo che c'è un futuro di sicuro, eh, lui ci mette la sua bocca e il suo naso ed è importante e eh, si impara cosa faccio io e qualche novità che ha visto lui in giro, magari qualche piccol, piccola robetta si riesce a migliorare sempre perché sono tutte la somma delle virgole che fanno la differenza. Ecco. So you, you take a lot of satisfaction from this so that you're able to see every day the steps that you're doing and you're doing them together so you'll be able to sort of teach and um, accompany Angelo as he learns more and more, but equally that he brings something new to the winery from the things that he's seen in uh, California and Australia, um, and that you can do that together. So it's going to be a joint journey. So that's, uh, that gives you a lot of satisfaction. Anche fai tu che mi conosci, sono molto critico anche anche nei confronti del figlio, quindi se vedessi che non ha la capacità di assaggiare, magari gli faccio fare ufficio, ecco, ma vedo che ha l'assaggio, cioè il naso lo usa, passione con gli amici e tutto e quindi è importante vedere, un padre vede insomma se un figlio riesce ecco, a subentrare nel suo lavoro, ecco, lo vedi subito se uno ha passione oppure no, ecco. E questo è importante avere anche eh, il metodo gustativo ma anche avere le papille gustative giuste, eh, sentire gli aromi, eh, ecco, questo lo, lo vedi subito, ecco, questo è importante. Uh, so Giuseppe is just saying that as a, a dad, then you see if your child actually has the, the skills necessary to be able to, to follow in your footsteps or not. And uh, he's saying that if he didn't, then he'd think, he wouldn't think twice about putting him in the office. But uh, as it is, luckily, uh, Angelo has a, has a true passion and also has the capacity, the tasting capacity and the skills to be an excellent winemaker. So he's really happy about that. Yeah, I, I've got a question then. I, I mean, first of all, this is one of the most fantastic wines I've ever had. And I was wondering um, the way you make it with drying the grapes. Um, is there any other region in Italy um, or even in Europe that uses the same process to make a wine like this? Yeah, so we are not the first in Valpolicella to do the, the drying process because uh, originally, they, 
trying process come from Sicily with the Marsala wine, so sweet wine, and also in Tuscany with the uh, Vin Santo. For the white so wine. the salt wine, white wine, both white wine, and also here in Valpolicella, so I arrived later, but became the, the main technique to to produce this, uh, <clears throat> this unique red wine because uh, usually, historically, the drying process uh, was used to make a white dessert wine. Here, we are completely in another way. We are in a red dry wine, so completely the opposite. But uh, the, res the result is uh, incredible in this red wine because uh, to, to be nothing, uh, to arrive to be the third uh, and one of the, the most important wine in red wine in the world. So, yeah, historically it didn't, it wasn't born here, but uh, here became uh, what the Dalian Prussian uh, dream process, process uh, is now in the wine world. So. Has anybody got any more questions? Quiet on the questions here, guys. Uh, you, you also had a, a very nice Amarone in Australia. So, uh, is it correct that uh, Amarone, as, as a way to make wine, is somehow unique, but not uh, not, not only seen in um, in in Valpolicella in the longer, but also. It's, Done uh, at, at many places elsewhere. Sorry, I didn't. Understand. So uh, many places. You, so many you have a, you had a very nice Amarone in, in Australia, right? Uh, so, or, or did, did I misunderstand you? Then? No, in Australia, what? Because I didn't hear it. No. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe uh, then, then I forget it. I, I got you wrong. The uh, question, Angelo, I think Angelo, no, uh, Amarone is Amarone della Valpolicella DOCG can only be produced in the Valpolicella. But the yeah. confusion arrived because, Angelo, you said that you had an Amarone in Australia. No, I drank it. Yeah, I drank yeah. one Amarone. Exactly. You drank it in Australia, but it wasn't in Australia. Well, Valpolicella. Uh, yeah. in Australia and Amarone from Valpolicella. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. okay. So that's, that's what, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they they are not allowed to. It's uh, like a U European laws to keep the safety of the appellation, and they are not allowed to 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 to, to plant as well. I think they cannot plant. Maybe. Uh, maybe do they, do they, they, do they plant? But they cannot use that that name. They cannot do the same process. So. Uh, is, is it just they, they cannot make, uh, cannot use the name, but, but make the same kind of wine? Like, like you have uh, Champagne is only made in, in some part of France, but there's a lot of uh, wines basically made to the same method? Or yeah, yeah. yeah, for the, ch the Champagne, they can use the method, but they can call Champagne. must call it somehow else, yes. Uh, is, is it, so is it probably, but I think Corvina is not a grape for Australia. Maybe something ah, okay. white mm -hmm. is more easy to, to use also in Australia, but for Corvina, it's, you know, it's too hot, too warm, to yeah. Yeah, with, with any protected appellation, it's linked to the terroir. So if it's called what, DOC, DOP, DOCG, it's linked to a specific area. That's like we were talking to the, about the seafood the other day from uh, from close uh, when Gianluca was mentioned about the seafood close to Monte Conero. It's because the mussels there, and not that they're particularly different. It's just that in that specific area, they are they give a certain taste. They have a certain quality, and it's the whole of the terroir that makes for that product to be better. So this is the that's the link with uh, Amarone. You could get those, you could get those grapevines and take them to Australia and make them in exactly the same way, but they definitely won't come out in the same, to the same uh, standard. 
Okay. Volevo dire che eh, ogni tanto qualcuno in giro per il mondo prova a copiare il nome Marone, ma il consorzio nel quale sono dentro da, oltre 22 anni come consigliere ne abbiamo una funzione sempre legale per di... sempre molto attenti alla difesa di questo perché molti che vogliono copiare questo è importante yeah exactly that's it that's part of the part of the job of any consortium really is to is to safeguard the name so if somebody else around the world is using is using a, a term that uh, there shouldn't be which is I'm, in this case I'm an owner of Apolicella then uh, they they send the, the legal people after them. Um, and it's very easy to, to get that reversed because they're not legally allowed to use it if it's a protected appellation. So. Anybody have, uh, have any more questions? Yeah, can I do so? Clive speaking. Yes, go, go ahead, Clive. So Amarone is obviously quite a bit stronger. So if you're having a let's say a larger dinner party, you wouldn't necessarily start with this. What kind of um, planning would you have? Would you have a policella earlier on and then uh, the amaroni at the end with the cheese or, or, or how would you, um, let's say, sequence the wines in your evening, typically in, uh, in your area and with what foods? Yeah, so in uh, typically here, we we match the, the this kind of wine uh, with uh, meat especially so could be any kind of meat also like from classic beef uh, to more wild meat uh, like uh, elbow for example pheasant or also lamb so also wild meat and uh, so with barbecue for example is i think it's one of the best match that you can make uh, but also with the uh, cheese and a cheese uh, marone it's fantastic so i think it's for a real meal so if you are also in a few people as you say like for a barbecue it's perfect maybe with the cheese if more for a meditation time so maybe less people and uh, uh, Pieces, different pieces of cheese and uh, yeah but meat and cheese are or maybe you can try both together as well so. <laughs> but uh, yeah meat and cheese a cheese especially yeah thanks you're welcome oh. um klaus and tessa also have uh, have a question yeah, Faye, you mentioned that this one is one of your favorite Amaroni. So what do you especially like at this one? I like the way that it's so integrated. Um, a real skill in making a good wine is that you get all the elements that fit together. And here you've got the tannins, you've got the alcohol, you've got the acidity and, and the structure. And it all just holds together. It's such a beautiful example of a, a well-knitted wine. There's nothing that, that sticks out. There's no sharp acidity. There's no uh, bitter wine. It's, no, it's just so compact and harmonious and beautifully elegant. Um, yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah, very good description because sometimes we taste the Amaroni which were quite fat and sweet and of course, they fit well to a, a barbecue beef steak, for example, but they were a little bit over the top. But as you mentioned, this one is very well integrated between the sweetness, the acidity and, and, and the alcohol. Yeah, very nice example. Thank you. Yes. There was once, a, there was once a, yeah, a program in the UK many years ago and uh, a woman described a, a wine as, as uh, being rubbed down with a, zel with a velvet glove. And this is a fine example of being able to having a velvet glove rubbed down your, your throat, I think it really is. Cool. We have a, a question about organic. Do you do any organic visiting? Yeah, there are wineries that uh, are making organic uh, marone, organic bapolicella, so all the line in organic way. 
So yeah, there are uh, it's not uh, more than half, but it's less than than a half. But there are wineries that are converting in to be organic, and uh, so yes, it's not super common, but uh, there are wineries that they are making. Uh, we work uh, as an organic, we can say that, but uh, we don't have the paper, so we don't have the, we never has to, to be organic, uh, but because we, we are really working also in the vineyards and the winery as we ever work, as we, we always sorry, work the, from the beginning, so also in I think you can feel these two wines that the level of sulfites is very, very low. So for the level of sulfites, we could be organic 100%, but uh, we, we don't like that someone came come here in our winery or in our vineyards uh, that we are working there from really since 1951 with my grandfather first. So we don't like that someone can come here and tell us what we have to do with our vineyards, what we have to do with our tanks to be organic for them. But uh, personally, every winery should be organic from the beginning without uh, a sticker, a, a green sticker. But of course, it's a good thing to be organic, that's for sure. But uh, you know, when you have something, someone that tell you what you have to do with your vineyards, that maybe is younger than you, I don't know. It's you can. Um, it's, a, it's a not difficult, but maybe someone want to work with his vineyards uh, without asking someone else uh, that maybe don't know him how to do to to be organic. And sometimes organic is also difficult because uh, you have to. To use, uh, for example, less sulfites, so you have to do, you have to work better in the vineyard, better in the in the cellar, be with uh, to, to to have uh, a high quality wine. So it's uh, just uh, you have, you cannot be always has been not organic, and in a couple of years be organic. So you need time to understand uh, how your grapes uh hard with less products in the vineyards uh, so how is uh, your wine how is developing your wine in the way to be organic uh, so it's take take a lot of time perfect yeah organic is i think we, we mentioned the other day with one of the other winemakers that organic is not necessarily um a route that everybody wants to go down and prefer to keep that flexibility of how to how to manage the vineyards um, according to what they need, rather than having some outdoor um, regulations in place on them. Um, if anybody, if we don't have any more questions at that point, I would say thank you ever so much. It's 20 past uh, 10, some people have already had to leave, um, but I know that everybody else wants to carry on and carry on drinking their, their Ambrosan um, and chatting. You'll go back in your rooms. Um, or say goodbye it's up to you um, and I will we'll see you on Wednesday Wednesday is the last appointment on this round of uh, Coram Vino we have uh, Jose Rallo from uh, Dona Fugata talking to us about uh, wines from Sardinia which will be really quite cool um, because for that one we have we have a Nero Davola from, from Sicily and we also have Benria Benria is like the ultimate Italian dessert wine um, so if you have the jewel box, you might want to uh, get that in the fridge and bake yourself some uh, chocolate muffins and anything else that I sent on the on the recipes. I think you already have them there. So uh, thank you ever so much. Uh, hey. Emile, Angelo. Hey, hey. Yes. Just before we go, can we uh, say thank you very much to Angelo for a fantastic evening? Yes. <laughs> That's thank, you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the Angelo as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you a lot. So really thank you. And maybe we can take a photo or a selfie together. I don't know if that's good enough. Oh yeah.
Let me hold on. Let me put. Uh, let put us all on. <laughs> Grazie a tutti. <laughs> Alla salute, leviamo alla salute. Speriamo. Sì, alla salute, grazie. Alla salute. Yeah. grazie. To, to everybody's health. Thank sì. you. Grazie mille, grazie Giuseppe, grazie Angelo. Grazie a tutti i partecipanti.